grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. So this Thursday, if I'm correct, begins the first episode of the final season of the TV comedy, The Good Place. Anybody out there watched this, a fan? Okay. Sometimes I, I mention things in my sermon that I, that I admit I cannot wholeheartedly recommend, but this, this one I, I do. It's this fascinating and, and funny series that is built on the premise of what happens to you in the afterlife. In the universe of the show, your fate is determined by a simple point system. You gain points for the good stuff you do in life, you lose points for the bad stuff you do, and when you die, if you've earned enough points, you go to the good place. In the very first episode, we meet Eleanor Shellstrop as she is being welcomed into the good place, except she harbors a secret. She is in the good place by mistake. Hilarity ensues. The show is both funny and profound. The characters explore questions about what it means to be truly good in life, how we make moral decisions, and how it is that we might act in a way that does the greatest amount of good in the best ways for the most or most deserving people. Now the characters on the show have an epiphany a couple seasons in about the truth the hidden truth of living a moral life. The epiphany is that the world is so complicated that there is perhaps no such thing as a pure good choice and a pure bad choice. The good things we do often have unintended negative consequences, and even the bad things we do can cause ripples of good in the world. I feel like their conundrum is our conundrum today as we read through this worst of the worst parable of Jesus, this very strange story of a rich landowner, a shrewd manager, and a bunch of unsuspecting clients. It's a confusing story, and it's complicated. It raises more questions than gives answers. For instance, did the manager cheat his boss? And if so, why would the boss commend him for it? Why was the manager being fired in the first place? When the manager schemed to reduce the debts of some of his master's debtors, were these debtors struggling under the weight of economic oppression? Or were they fellow rich men doing business with the rich landowner? Did these debtors show the manager hospitality once he was fired as he had hoped? Is the rich man supposed to be the good guy or the bad guy? Who are we supposed to root for? Who are we supposed to identify with? And what do we do with the fact that despite some shady business practices, everybody in the parable ends up benefiting in the end? And then why does Jesus seem to endorse the manager's shrewdness before speaking plainly about the conflict between serving God and wealth. This is a complicated parable, and I have complicated feelings toward it. And whatever good news there is to be found in this parable is complicated as well. And perhaps that's the point. Notice that Jesus does not begin this parable like he does so many others by saying the kingdom of heaven is like. That is on purpose. Jesus is not telling this parable today to describe the kingdom. He's telling this parable to describe the world in which we live. He speaks truthfully, as he has been speaking for weeks now in Luke's gospel, about this complicated relationship that people of faith have with wealth and possessions. He speaks truthfully in this parable about the complicated economies in which we live and participate, where all of our choices have consequences, whether intended or unintended, good or bad. 
Jesus is right, of course, when he talks about shrewdness, because it takes an incredible amount of shrewdness and cunning and thought to even begin to pull back the layers of all of the complicated economies in which we live and participate in our world. For example, just a few weeks ago, pictures surfaced of the Jimmy John's CEO posing sometimes tastelessly with animals that he killed in illegal big game hunts. And we have the ongoing saga of Chick-fil-A and the corporate funds it has donated to organizations opposing same-sex marriage. And we have really recent news of mega corporations like Amazon and Microsoft and retailers like Wayfair who have supplied and supported controversial ICE detention centers. And so, each of us in faith is challenged to consider what it is to live with faith and integrity in this economy as we consider where we shop and what we eat, how deeply we choose to dig into the corporate values behind our daily purchases, what we are willing to resist and what we are willing to overlook. It's complicated. Or how about two news stories that recently surfaced about at the same time? One, the news story of an ultra-rich CEO whose company cut health benefits for its part-time workers, despite the fact that the cost of providing those benefits is equivalent to what this CEO makes in a mere six hours of work. And then the other story, breaking simultaneously, A story of a university basketball coach turning down a raise at the time of his contract extension, saying, quote, I have more than enough, and if there are ways that this can help out other programs and coaches, that's my desire. Jesus asks us to think seriously about this question of what is enough and what is too much, and we are challenged to consider how our own security or prosperity are being one at the steep cost of others' struggles, how it is that we are willing or able to give back and to advocate for living wages and sufficient benefits for others, especially those times when it makes us look out of touch, naive, or bleeding heart to the rest of the world. It's complicated. Or what then about the additional billion dollars of farm subsidies coming to Iowa to help mitigate losses from trade disputes with China and the EU and Canada and Mexico? Subsidies that benefit large corporate farms more than smaller ones. Subsidies that raise questions about what crops are farmed and what crops make it to the market and what is being sacrificed to keep prices stable and also the unintended upshot with all of this being that all of this extra unsellable food production is making its way to food banks, which means that our community food pantry has more food to give away right now than ever. Faith and today's parable ask us to consider the hidden costs and the hidden benefits to the way that our economy works and to wonder how we should react to a system that can both perpetuate extremes of wealth and poverty and also have times of mutual benefit. It's complicated. It is into this complicated world, into the complications of economy and empire and daily life, that God showed up in the person of Jesus, taking on all the joys and burdens of having a body and a vocation, the joys and burdens and complications of making friends and making enemies, participating in society, proclaiming a kingdom of God, trying to put together the pieces of faith and politics and religion and economy in a new way, even if it would end up costing him his life. Jesus did this for the sake of love and generosity, forgiveness and justice, liberation and life, the things of God's kingdom. And Jesus transforms our hearts to live for these things also. 
when Jesus asks us to be shrewd, when Jesus asks us to reconsider the demands of wealth, Jesus is really just asking us to care. To care enough to view the world through God's eyes and the eyes of faith. That's what I think today's parable is about. Jesus asking us not to live an unquestioned life in this world, pretending that our faith only matters here in worship or in Bible study. Jesus is asking us to live each and every moment of our lives in service of God, in honor of Christ's love. Jesus asks us to think faithfully about how we spend our money and how our decisions affect creation and how our actions affect our neighbors. Jesus asks us to care even when things are complicated because things are complicated. This is the legacy of faith that we carry, the path of Jesus that we follow. We do not leave our existence in this world unchecked or unevaluated. We turn over every stone that we might seek in all things to be gracious and generous, concerned about what is being trampled, seeking whomever is left forgotten, understanding the value of everything in God's sight, and also making peace with the fact that everything in this world will one day pass away. The poet Mary Oliver writes, I don't know exactly what a prayer is. I do know how to pay attention. This, my friends, is perhaps the best and most poetic summary of what this life of faith is all about. Not that we say all the right words in prayer or do all the right things in worship or know all the right things about theology, but rather that we learn from Christ how to pay attention, how to care about this world, and how to care deeply, how to live into the fullness of the love that has been shown to us by putting and pouring our hearts into every move we make in this world, the big moves and the little moves, the profound and the mundane. This world is complicated. Jesus doesn't ask you to solve it, but he does ask you to care about it. And in doing so, bit by bit, salvation does come to earth. Amen.